I think we can all agree that when it comes to fantasy universes, there are very few that are as in-depth and complex as the Elder Scrolls. But of course, the Elder Scrolls is a fictional world. It's still written and worked on by multiple people over the course of 30 years, which leads to the inevitable, retcons and inconsistencies. In this video, we're going to be going over the many ways the lore and worldbuilding of the Elder Scrolls has changed over time, sometimes accidentally, sometimes intentionally, sometimes for the better, and sometimes for the worse. So, of course, we have to start with the arena, where the initial lore of the Elder Scrolls was first established. Arena is very different from modern Elder Scrolls when you really take a look back at it, and not just in terms of gameplay. The lore was, of course, much more simplistic, and went for a very typical fantasy slash sword and sorcery vibe. What little lore we did get from that era was often buried in brief in-game dialogue and descriptions or small blurbs and manuals. Let's start off with the most immediately obvious difference, being the beast races, the Argonians and the Khajiit. Both of them are much more human-like than how they appear in later games, with Khajiit basically just being humans with facial tattoos. Khajiit were described to have been descended from an intelligent feline race, rather than being actual cat people. Nowadays, we know that the Khajiit we see in Arena are a specific kind of Khajiit, being of the Ohm's first stock, and that Khajiit appear differently depending on what phases of the moons they were born under. Argonians also went by a very different naming scheme back then, having Roman and Greek names like Augustus, Claudius, Heracles, and so on. This naming scheme would later be used for Imperials, and Argonians would go on to have their own names that follow their own language, Gel. Speaking of Imperials, they actually didn't exist in Arena. Cyrodiil didn't exist either. The central province we see in Arena was known as the Imperial Province, and it only had one city, the Imperial City. It was envisioned as a place where all the different races of Tamriel mingled together, and the same would go for the Imperial family. Because of all the political marriages that would happen all across Tamriel, the royal family would be a mix of all the different races. Imperials wouldn't exist as their own distinct race until Redguard was released. As for why only the Imperial City existed, the idea was for there to be no other potential rival capitals in its vicinity, with all the land around it acting like a moat. In fact, River Holden elsewhere is described as the closest city-state to the Imperial Isle. Speaking of city descriptions, look at this one for Sentinel in Hammerfell. Wary Traveler, thou art entering Sentinel, the guardian of Starfall Bay. Learn what it is to be survivors, for amongst enemies we stand alone. It appears that Starfall Bay was the original name for what we now know as the Iliac Bay. Looking at some enemies found in the game, we see that orcs actually make an appearance, but they were simply mindless enemies like in any other fantasy game. You can't play as them, and there is no concept of orcs anymore or culture. Another weird enemy in the game are the Lizardmen. The game manual states that they were once thought to be distant cousins of the Argonians, but are far more animal than human. Sounds like something that could have interesting lore implications, but they're basically wiped from the series after this and are never mentioned ever again, so we'll never really know what these things exactly were. Also, a couple of deities were first mentioned by name in Arena, though they were mostly envisioned as great heroes or powerful mortals. For example, Finaster is a deity worshipped by the High Elves, but he was said to be killed by a group called the Wharf Rats for his ring and burned in a place known as the Forest of Elborn in Arena. Kinnereth was described as a spirit that bestowed the Lord's Mail upon Mora House, and was buried in a crypt in Skyrim after she died. What I would say is probably the most direct retcon can be found in the manual. We can see that the eras of Tamriel were supposed to last for 1000 years. This is why the intro slide states that the game, which occurs in 3 E389, takes place 492 years after Tiber Septim became the Emperor, which was in 2 E896. Another one would be the fact that dragons, as they're seen in Arena, have four legs. If you haven't noticed, the dragons seen throughout all later Elder Scrolls games have only two legs. Moving on to Daggerfall, we can immediately see that the designs for both Argonians and Khajiit have changed, with both getting far more animal-like qualities. This next one is relatively well known and might be the most egregious in-game error made in the entire series. Queen Baron Zaya is wrongly depicted as a Breton within the game, when in-game lore and all future appearances of her depict her as a Dark Elf. The Daggerfall intro gives a bit of context about what's going on across Tamriel during the time of the game. It says that wars and rebellions have been spreading all throughout Tamriel as Zerio Septim has been unable to repair the damage his predecessors have caused. 
We can even see a depiction of some kind of war occurring between Morrowind and Skyrim. Future games certainly touch on the crumbling of the Septim Empire, but there's literally no mention of any of these wars in future games. Like in Arena, the lore for dragons was a bit different in Daggerfall, being treated more like how they're seen in traditional fantasy, as simply rare and legendary beasts. One of the enemies you can encounter in the game are the Dragonlings, which resemble miniature dragons. They were even featured rather prominently in the Daggerfall exclusive book King Edward, as creatures that resided within mountain villages and could get along rather well with humans. You may have also heard of the dragon Skakmat. Skakmat doesn't actually appear or is ever mentioned in-game, only found buried within some data files, but is mentioned in the Daggerfall Chronicles, the official Daggerfall strategy guide. Skakmat was the familiar of Nalfaga, who was the mother of King Lysandus and the Dowager Queen of Daggerfall. Skakmat was also the one who created the strange fog that covered the battlefield during the Battle of Kringane Field in the War of Betany, which is an important event set before the game's narrative. This doesn't really fit with how dragons are eventually depicted in Skyrim lore-wise, and the name Skakmat doesn't follow the dragon name convention we later see, so Skakmat's place in the lore is kind of weird and uncertain. The dragonlings were also later described to be oversized reptiles in the Skyrim book, and they are be dragons. So basically, the role dragons played within the lore of the Elder Scrolls changed a lot over time. We're going to be diving deep into some in-game texts for these next ones. During the process of character creation, after you choose a class, you can answer a few questions to determine things like character traits and the backstory for that class, as well as what items you start the game with. The backstories all contain some variation of how the player character came to be in the service of the Emperor. Depending on which answers you give and which class you end up with, some of the backstories can mention that when the player character was in an audience with the Emperor while staying in the Imperial Province, their favorite activity was swimming in the murky waters of the Caledon River. More likely than not, this was the original name of the Nibbin River, the massive river that runs from the center of Cyrodiil down south to the Topal Bay, as seen in Oblivion. Even if it doesn't mean the Nibbin River, there is no such river that can be found in Oblivion, or anywhere else in the lore, called the Caledon River. Another inconsistency related to Daggerfall's backstories is that it mentions heirs of the Uriel Sepim that seemingly don't exist. Once again, depending on what answers you give and which class you end up with, some of the backstories described that the player character, through one way or another, ended up saving a prince, being the son of the Emperor. The generated backstory would assign one of six names to this prince, being Cassander, Trabatus, Pelagius, Viragial, Sephiris, and Uriel. However, when we fast forward to the time of Morrowind, in-game rumors claim that Septim has only three heirs, their names being Galdal, Enmin, and Ebel, none of which match the names from Daggerfall. This next one is a small one you might have never realized. You know how the elven races have their own distinct racial terms, being the Altmer, Dunmer, and Bosmer, right? Well, they're never actually called those in Arena and Daggerfall, only going by High Elf, Dark Elf, and Wood Elf. That's not an inconsistency on its own, but they have an entirely different name in Daggerfall that's spread within the game. One of the books that we can find in Daggerfall is The Wild Elves, which gives a very brief description of the Aeliads. The book can also be found in Morrowind, Oblivion, Skyrim, and ESO but there's one key difference between the Daggerfall version of the book and all the other versions. The Daggerfall edition also mentions the three elven races, but instead of calling them the Altmer, the Dunmer, and the Bosmer, they are called the Salach, Marich, and Boich respectively. It appears that these were the original racial names that were intended for the elves, but for reasons unknown, they were replaced later. All versions of the book in future games change this and call them the Altmer, Dunmer, and Bosmer. The original terms do make small appearances here and there in ESO though. The next book we'll be taking a look at is The Brothers of Darkness. Like the Wild Elves, this is another book that appears in all mainline games since Daggerfall. And once again, there's a key difference between the Daggerfall version of the book and all the other ones. But before we get to that, Let's analyze the contents of this original version of the book. It gives a brief history of the Dark Brotherhood, their motives and mode of operation. It says that before the Dark Brotherhood, there was the Morag Tong, 
which was described as a religious order that worshipped the Daedric Prince Mephala and committed ritual murders in her name. The Morag Tong was controlled by a figure known as the Night Mother. They were mostly left alone until 2E324, when they murdered Potentate Versa Duche, and were afterwards hunted down by all kingdoms across Tamriel. The Morag Tong seemingly vanished for about a hundred years until they re-emerged as the Dark Brotherhood. They began operating as an assassin's guild and committing killings for hire, and still followed a figure known as the Night Mother. This is pretty different from how we know the Dark Brotherhood and the Morag Tong today. The very next game, Morrowind, established that the Morag Tong is still very much around, and that they had their origins within the province. In fact, they had a bitter rivalry with the Dark Brotherhood, both of them existing at the same time. The Morag Tong has no ties whatsoever to the Night Mother, and are instead fully devoted to Mephala. It's also established in Morrowind that the Night Mother is a rank that can be assigned to certain members of the Dark Brotherhood. But, in the very next game, Oblivion, the Night Mother is a spirit that's revered by the organization, and is said to be the wife of the Death God Sithis, who they worship. Fun fact, the Dark Brotherhood existed all the way back in Arena, and were described as followers of Sithis, so this is somewhat a return to form. And that in Skyrim, the Night Mother is an actual corpse that you can talk to. That's not even where the inconsistencies end. The Daggerfall version of the Brothers of Darkness goes on to say that in 2E430, the Dark Brother would assassinate Potentate Severian Chorak and all of his heirs. If you didn't know, both Versidu Shea and Severian Chorak are Saesi from Akavir, and ruled the Empire for much of the Second Era. But, this book writes that Severian Chorak is Kalovian, and that the Kalovian dynasty crumbled shortly after his death. Kalovia is the name for the western half of Cyrodiil. Speaking of Akavir, it's also mentioned throughout a few books in Daggerfall, but it seems that it was nothing but raiders, slavers, and pirates that occupied some islands to the west of High Rock. Regardless, future versions of the book changed them to be Akaviri, not Kalovian. But even then, it's not known for sure if the Dark Brotherhood really was the one to kill Severian Shorak, as the book, Sacred Witness, claims that it was the Morak Tong that killed him instead. Yeah, it's all just one big mess. The next one I'm going to be talking about regards a pretty obscure figure in lore, Ebonarm. Ebonarm was a minor deity that was sometimes mentioned throughout Daggerfall to be the god of war. The thing is, Daggerfall is the only game in which he's mentioned, and he's basically disappeared from the lore ever since. There are other minor deities that are mentioned only in Daggerfall, but Ebonarm was much more prominent than the rest of them, being mentioned across several of its in-game books. One of them is from the Memory Stone of Makila Lucky, which talks about the life of Makila Lucky, one of the most revered Redguard heroes. There are two versions of the book, one in Daggerfall and one in ESO. Ebonarm is mentioned three times by name in the Daggerfall version, but he's completely erased from the ESO version. At the same time, he was mentioned in two other books from Daggerfall that were later added to Skyrim for the Creation Club, The Light and the Dark and The Ebon Arm. Regardless of whether he's canon or not, Ebon Arm is a much less prominent character than he was made out to be in Daggerfall. There is one last retcon regarding a Daggerfall book that I'd like to talk about, and it has to do with the Cameron Dynasty. The Cameron Dynasty was the most prominent royal family of Valenwood, and was historically Bosmer. Mankar Cameron, the main antagonist of Oblivion, is descended from the Cameron Dynasty. But, it's more likely than not that the Camerons were actually supposed to be Bretons. This time, we're looking at the book Wayrest, Jewel of the Bay, which goes over the history of the city-state of Wayrest in High Rock. Wayrest was a small fishing village that blossomed soon after the fall of Orsinium in 1 E980. A wealthy mercantile family, the Gardeners, soon built a palace over the land and invited banks and other businesses inside their walls. It then goes on to say that they accepted ambassadors from the Cameron dynasty in 1 E1100, who granted them the right to become their own kingdom. So, unless the Cameron dynasty somehow controlled almost all of Western Tamriel at this point, which is highly unlikely if you look into their history, then the original idea for them must have been that they were supposed to be based in High Rock. Like before, the ESO version of the book completely omits any information about the Camerons. The Daggerfall Chronicles further supports this, as it states that Haman Cameron, 
the Cameron Usurper who would actually go on to conquer much of Western Tamriel in the Third Era, was rumored to be the son of Mo Lagbal and a Breton woman. Another book, The Fall of the Usurper, states that the Cameron Usurper ruled from Castle Whitemore in the Barony of Dwinan, which is a region in High Rock. And yeah, this is all kind of weird and doesn't really make sense when once again, we know that the Camerons were based historically in Valenwood. And of course, you can't bring up Elder Scrolls retcons without talking about Dragon Breaks. Daggerfall originally had seven different endings. The ending you get depends on who you give the Totem of Tiber Septum to, which would be used in order to activate Numidium, a powerful golem once used by Tiber Septum to conquer much of Tamriel. But of course, that causes problems when you're trying to make a sequel. So, when Morwen rolled around, it was explained that the activation of Numidium caused a dragon break known as the Warp in the West. This caused time to become non-linear, making all of the game's endings canon at the same time. Speaking of Morrowind, that game and Redguard are where modern Elder Scrolls lore was pretty firmly established, and lots of the retcons previously mentioned stem from changes made to the lore in those two games. Comparing the maps of Morrowind as seen in Arena and as we know it today, we can see that they're pretty different, with tons of islands off the coasts of Vardenfell that didn't exist before. Speaking of Vardenfell, it actually didn't used to go by that name. The description for the city of Ebonheart in Arena referred to it as the Black Isle. We can also see that several of the cities seen in Morwen didn't exist at all in Arena, and the ones that did went by different names. Balmora was known as Stone Forest, Margen was the Mark Grand Forest, and Aldruin was called Old Run. These were later explained to be imperialized names that the Third Empire wrote on their official maps, but weirdly enough, Old Run is marked on a completely different location than where Aldrin appears in Morrowind. Flash forwarding a bit, Skyrim has the same kind of issue. For example, Markarth is called Markarth Side and essentially swaps place with Karth Wasted Hall. And Morthal just doesn't exist on the arena map. Getting back to Morrowind, take a look at Mornhold's description in Arena. You enter Mornhold, lost city state of the First Empire. It is said that a great evil resides under this city, slowly driving its citizens mad. Yeah, that's pretty different from how we see in the Tribunal expansion in Morrowind. If you'll remember, there are Dwemer ruins that could be uncovered beneath the city, and the book series, The Real Baron Zaya, describes how the Staff of Chaos was supposedly hidden within caverns that also stretched underneath it. That could explain the Lost City-State part, but what that has to do with the First Empire is never explained. The first edition of the Pocket Guide to the Empire is also kinda weird when it comes to Mournhold. It goes by the name Almalexia, named after the member of the Tribunal, and is said to be an ancient city that predates the Dark Elves. Mournhold is described as a palace slash temple that's like a city within a city, but again, in the actual game, the entire city is just Mournhold. As you might have heard before, the Imperial province that we see in Oblivion is very different from how it was first described in the original Pocket Guide. Cyrodiil was envisioned as being covered in endless jungles, with river societies that lived off of rice fields and had hundreds of gods and animalistic cults. The Imperial city was imagined as something almost out of this world, as seen in this passage. From the shore, it is hard to tell what is city and what is palace, for it all rises from the islands of the lake towards the sky in a stretch of gold. Whole neighborhoods rest on the jeweled bridges that connect the islands together. Gondolas and river ships sail along the watery avenues of its flooded lower dwellings. Moth priests walk by in a cloud of ancestors. House guards hold exceptionally long daikatanas crossed at intersections, adorned with ribbons and dragon flags. And the newly arrived Western legionaries sweat in the humid air. The river mouth is tainted red from the tin mai soil of the shore and river dragons rust their hides in its waters. Across the lake, the Imperial City continues, merging into the villages of the Southern Red River and ruins left from the Interregnum. The Emperor's Palace is a crown of sun rays, surrounded by his magical gardens. One garden path is known as Green Emperor Road. Here, topiaries of the past emperors have been shaped by sorcery and can speak. When one must advise Ty Perceptum, Birds are drawn to the Hedry Head, using their songs as its voice and moving its branches for the needed expressions. Sounds incredible, right? And then what do we get in Oblivion? 
Hello. The Emperor and his three sons, dead. Right under the noses of the Imperial Guard. It's a disgrace. I just don't think about it. The Elder Council will take care of things, sooner or later. Really? Have you heard any word about the other provinces? I've heard that the Nords of Skyrim have been warring with the Rhetorin of Morrowind. The Nords have always been protective of their territory. It's no wonder they get involved in these disputes. So long. Leave me alone. Eh? All jokes aside, Oblivion's a great game, but this early version of Serial sounds pretty great too. Another quick one for Oblivion is a certain statue that we can find in the Imperial City, the one for Mora House. The thing is, the Mora House we know resembles a winged bull, so why does he have a statue that depicts him as a man? As far as we can tell, he was always supposed to be a man until the Knights of the Nine expansion rolled around, and we got the first real description of him. And then we get to good old Skyrim. So, believe it or not, the whole dragon cult thing being a pretty big part of Nord culture was only added when the game rolled around, and there wasn't really anything in the lore beforehand that mentioned this. The same goes for Shouts, or the Thu'um. It's only in Skyrim where it's first mentioned that they were taught to mankind by their dragon lords. The book, Varieties of Faith in the Empire, which first appeared in Morrowind, states that it was the Daughters of Kind that taught Nords how to use the Thu'um. Going back to the first edition of the Pocket Guide to the Empire, it seems that Shouts were initially envisioned as some kind of spiritual magic that was inherent to all Nords. Its most powerful wielders are the Tongues, who can't speak without causing destruction and have to go gagged, communicating through sign language and runes, which, yeah, we don't really see in Skyrim. Other bits of earlier lore scattered throughout the previous games also don't really come up in Skyrim either. For example, the final paragraph of the book, Children of the Sky, which first appeared in Morrowind, has this to say. The further north you go into Skyrim, the more powerful and elemental the people become, and the less they require dwellings and shelters. Wind is fundamental to Skyrim and the Nords. Those that live in the far wastes always carry a wind with them. This seems to fit when we look at Solstheim in the Blood Moon expansion, where you can find berserkers that live in burrows and go out bare chested during blizzards, as well as Freishags that practice ice magic and live in caves. The Imperial missionaries on the island mention that the locals practice bear and wolf worship, but none of that really appears in Skyrim. The same goes for the Nordic Pantheon. While you'll sometimes hear names like Kain, Shor, Junal, and so on, and sees small traces of them throughout the game, it seems for the most part that worship of the Imperial Pantheon is much more prevalent. Now, to be fair, Skyrim does take place 200 years after the other games, which is probably more than enough time for the dominant religion in the province to change, especially under heavy Imperial occupation. Going back to Oblivion really quickly, we can find a Nord couple living in Ruma, Hanmund and Alga. They claim that they live together in the traditional Nord fashion, Without any ties to Mara, the imperial goddess of love, or going to a temple. I'm Alga. I'm a bard and a speechcraft trainer. Hanmund is my live-in partner. No offense, but I don't want to hear about any Mara Mother Mild and Chapel family business. Hanmund and I live together in the old Nord way. Good enough for my fa and ma, and good enough for me. But, marriage in Skyrim does involve a ceremony under Mara. But again, maybe traditions just changed after 200 years. Another difference is how the Volkahar vampires are portrayed in the Dawnguard expansion. The Volkahar are first mentioned back in Oblivion with the book Immortal Blood, which is a narrative talking about the different groups of vampires spread across Tamriel. Here's what's said about them. He wanted to know about the vampires of Eastern Skyrim. I told him about the most powerful tribe the Volkahar, paranoid and cruel, whose very breath could freeze their victim's blood in the veins. I explained to him how they lived beneath the ice of remote and haunted lakes, never venturing into the world of men except to feed. Another line mentions that they can reach through the ice of their lakes without breaking it. We see none of these abilities or traits in the game, and they're not even located in eastern Skyrim. The Draugr are also kind of weird as well. If you'll remember, they also appeared in Morwen for the Bloodwind expansion, 
but the lore surrounding the Draugr in Morrowind and in Skyrim is completely different. The Draugr we see on Soul Slim and Morrowind were once members of a tribe that ate the flesh of the dead, and were said to be punished by a deity known as the Allmaker for their crimes against nature by being cursed to be eternally undead. The Draugr seen in Skyrim, the ones buried in all those Nordic crypts, are tied to the Dragon Cult. These were followers of Dragon Priests, and were made undead and buried with their masters. They would rise to worship their priests and to defend their bearers from intruders. I guess you could say they're just different kinds of Draugr if you really wanted to, but still. Also, we don't exactly know when Rorikstead was founded, as there are lots of contradictions surrounding it. Rorik, the supposed founder of the town, claims that he bought the land soon after he fought in the Great War and that the town was named after him. Yes, that's right. Look around you. Most of the lands you see are mine. Most of this I purchased while my comrades were fighting in the south, helping the Empire against the Aldmeri Dominion. Back then, nothing would grow here, and so the land was worthless. Now, thanks to the hard work and the gods' blessings, our farms prosper. But there are two books found in the game that outright state that the town existed much, much earlier than the Fourth Era. The book, Atlas of Dragons, which was written in 2E373, claims that the dragon Nahagaliv was buried in the mound west of Rorikstead. The book, Holdings of Jarl Gjalland, which dates back to at least the First Era and possibly the Marethic Era, mentions a town called Rorikstedding. It has to be the same town, because it's described as a small farmstead in the western plains. So, unless these books are historically inaccurate, or Rorik is just lying, this doesn't really make a lot of sense. It gets even weirder because, in Arena, there's a city called Lane Alta that matches up exactly with where Rorik's set is located. So, what's right? Who knows? Stuff also gets pretty weird when it comes to some of the artifacts found in-game. Remember Umbra from Oblivion and Morrowind? Skyrim brings it back through the Creation Club, when it makes absolutely no sense to. Why? Well, in the two official Elder Scrolls novels, The Infernal City and Lord of Souls, which takes place in between Oblivion and Skyrim, the sword is a very important part of the plot, and it ends up ultimately being destroyed. So why is it in Skyrim? The dagger Keening also makes an appearance, which is another artifact that appeared in Morrowind. Remember how you needed to wear the gauntlet Wraithguard before using Keening, or else you'd immediately die? Well, for some reason, that just doesn't happen anymore in Skyrim. You can use Keening just fine without Wraithguard. I'm sure you remember the end of Oblivion, how Martin Septim sacrificed himself in order to banish Marin's Dagon and his forces back to Oblivion, and to permanently seal the gates that allowed them to come in. Thing is, there have been quite a few instances of Daedra returning to Tamriel since then. The Elder Scrolls novels that I previously mentioned focus on Umbriel, a massive floating island within a pocket dimension of Oblivion that managed to appear on Nern. The forgotten hero plot of the Elder Scrolls Legends features an event known as the Culling, in which the Thalmor General, Lord Narifin, opened an Oblivion Gate, allowing for a massive Daedric invasion into the Imperial City itself. The Skyrim Creation Club quest, The Cause, features the return of the Mythic Dawn and allows you to open an Oblivion Gate and travel to Oblivion. So, what did Martin's sacrifice do, exactly? And last but not least, The Elder Scrolls Online. You might have heard a thing or two about some of the controversies surrounding the lore in this game, like why aren't any of the events that happen in this game, which takes place before any of the other Elder Scrolls games, mentioned in the other games. To be completely fair, ESO came after every other game, and the lore for it just wasn't created yet. Besides, it's not like the books we see across the games represent every single history book that exists on Tamriel. They're just the ones we happen to come across. But that's not to say that ESO doesn't have some inconsistencies spread throughout. To start with, we can find several books across the game that were written in the future. To give a well-known example, The Lost the Argonian Maid. This play was written by Crassius Curio, a counselor for House Lalu in the late Third Era. But, we can find this book in ESO, which is in the middle of the Second Era. This is explained through the Gandrinan Ruins, which were built by an alien worshipper of Hermaeus Moore that attracted books from across time and space. But believe it or not, 
ESO gives the lusty Argonian maid some kind of weird lore significance. There is another book found in the game called The Argonian Maid, an oral tradition. The author of the book saw a live version of the play, and through some research, discovered that the story has its historical origins in songs told by traveling bards that all have a slightly different name and premise. We've got The Lusty Boz Mary, Two Moons for Sugar, The Sandy Spear of the Alakir, and it goes on. So, The Lusty Argonian Maid wasn't exactly invented by Crassius Curio. It seemingly always existed in some form, and is apparently pretty significant to many of Tamriel's cultures. Now that's a good retcon. And speaking of time and space, we have the same situation as in Oblivion, where we once again have no jungle Cyrodiil. This one is a little bit stranger compared to the case in Oblivion though. ESO takes place 300 years before 2E864, which is when the first edition of the Paka Guide to the Empire was written, which, as I mentioned before, depicts Cyrodiil as being covered in jungle. A book can be found in the game titled Subtropical Cyrodiil, A Speculation, which talks about different records and mentions of a jungled Cyrodiil and gives a theory on why it no longer appears that way. There are all kinds of different theories and speculations that try to rationalize this, but I'm not here to talk about that. Moving on, lots of statues spread across Tamriel look very different from how they appeared in earlier games. It's not clear if this is how they were always supposed to look, or if they've just been changed and redesigned over time. Remember that one super cool place in Morrowind, Dizel's House of Earthly Delights? Well, it appears in ESO too. But the weird thing is, it's also called the Zell's House of Earthly Delights, even though the owner, Helvion de Zell, only appears in Morrowind, which is hundreds of years in the future. Maybe it's a family-run establishment. While we're on the topic of places that shouldn't exist, remember Cropsford from Oblivion? That one town that gets built after you end the Goblin War that's going on in that area? That also appears in ESO, even though we literally see the town get founded hundreds of years later. But it doesn't end there. Let's quickly go back to Morrowind and look at this paragraph from the book, A Short History of Morrowind. In 3E414, Vardenfell territory, previously a temple preserve under imperial protection, was reorganized as an imperial provincial district. Vardenfell had been maintained as a preserve administrated by the temple since the Treaty of the Armistice, and except for a few great house settlements sanctioned by the temple, Vardenfell was previously uninhabited and undeveloped. But when the centuries-old temple ban on trade and settlement of Vardenfell was revoked by King of Morrowind, a flood of imperial colonists and Great House Thunder came to Vardenfell, expanding old settlements and building new ones. Morrowind takes place in 3E427, meaning that many of the imperial settlements that we see in-game had to have been built in the 13 years since 3E414. But, Sedanin, which is one of these imperial settlements, exists in ESO, and it has the same exact building and architectural style that we see in Morrowind. How is this possible? Lawrence Schick, who was the lore master for ESO, says that it exists because it was built by the Gold Coast Trading Company, who had a trade deal with the Halalu. Now, to be fair, other imperial settlements from Morrowind like Pelagiad and Caldera don't exist in ESO, so it does stay consistent in that regard. Sedanin is a bit too iconic to leave out of the game, but in all honesty, it really shouldn't be here at this time. On the other hand, there is a place that should exist, but doesn't. The Elder Scrolls Red Guard takes place on the island of Strauss Mackay, and one of the locations you can visit there is the Dragon Tail Inn. The sign out front says that it was established in 2E284, and the game takes place in 2E864, meaning that by the time of ESO, it should be there. But when you go to Stros Mackay in-game and check out where it should be, it's not there at all. This was by no means a definitive list. I'm sure there are more than one or two retcons or inconsistencies that I've missed. If you have any you'd like to mention, drop them down in the comments below. For all these changes and mishaps, the world of the Elder Scrolls is still one of the most amazing and detailed fantasy worlds out there, and I think that there are far more things to appreciate about it than criticize. Let's see what changes and additions are made when The Elder Scrolls VI finally comes out. In like, 50 years. <laughs>